<laughs> for the most fun introduction I've been given. Oh, yeah. So uh, hi everyone. So uh, I'm uh, going to talk today about uh, the project that I've been working on mainly for the last few years, CHIME, which is a radio telescope. And uh, by background, I should say that I'm mainly a CMB cosmologist. But for the last few years, I've been pretending to be a radio astronomer working on this project. And I'm going to tell you why I think it's um, especially interesting. Um, so first, of course, I'd like to uh, acknowledge all of my collaborators. There are around 150 people to, in Chime total, too many people to acknowledge individually. That includes everyone from people that tighten bolts on the telescope to people like me that write software and uh, come up with algorithms. Uh, Chime is mainly a collaboration between large teams at the four institutions at the top row and uh, smaller teams at these in institutions, including Perimeter Institute. Uh, so first, I'm just going to uh, give a high-level introduction to the uh, general idea of what we're trying to do with CHIME. Uh, so just uh, first, some high-level uh, summary statistics that will be useful to keep in mind. Uh, so CHIME is located in uh, British Columbia at the Dominion Radio Astronomy uh, Observatory, the big Canadian radio astronomy facility. And it's the first new large Canadian research telescope in several decades. And uh, it's a compact interferometer with no moving parts. These four cylinders just sit on the ground. Uh, except for the moving part, which is always present, which is the Earth. So as the sky rotates, the, uh, this instrument sweeps out the whole northern sky every 24 hours. Uh, each of these four cylinders is instrumented with 256 antennae, or uh, dual polarization feeds. So this is a 1,024 feed system with a total collecting area of 80, square, 80 meters by 80 meters, which is comparable to other large research radio telescopes, such, like, such as Parkes or GBT. And it observes in radio frequency range 400 to 800 megahertz. That frequency range was originally selected for doing 21 centimeter cosmology in this redshift range, 0.8 to 2.5. The so-called redshift desert, which is a little bit too high redshift to observe a lot of galaxies, but too low redshift to observe the Lyman Alpha Forest. Uh, so I want to start by just showing some cartoons that contrast the CHIME concept to a traditional radio telescope with a big dish. Uh, so the big dish focuses by uh, physical delays. The optics of the telescope have been constructed so that a bundle of rays coming in from infinity, uh, the optics are arranged so that all of these path lengths are the same and the radiation interferes constructively at the feed. And for a bundle of rays coming in fr from infinity in a different direction, the constructive interference condition would not be satisfied and the telescope would be out of focus. Uh, in practice, you can usually fit a few feeds here, maybe order 10 that are in focus, but after that it becomes difficult. Uh, now, uh, I want you to imagine in this picture getting rid of the dish and simulating the dish in software instead. Uh, what I mean by that is that I re replace this uh, physical uh, piece of metal by an array of antennas. Each X is an antenna where the radiation is just captured and uh, converted to digital. And uh, then once I've digitized the electric field, uh, I can combine the signals at each of these locations with the appropriate delays to mimic the focusing effect of, tel of the telescope optics. Uh, so by summing the signals with one set of delays, I could uh, simulate a dish in software and focus on one part of the sky. If I want to repoint the telescope, I just apply a different set of delays and then focus on another part of the sky. Uh, and what this gains is that uh, because uh, time streams may, digital time streams may be copied freely. Once you've digitized the time stream, then it doesn't destroy, you can copy it as many times as you want without destroying information. Then uh, you can repeat this software beamforming process for n directions at once. Uh, so where n is just the number of beams where you can afford to do the computation. Um, so by repeating this process n times in parallel, you can gain the sensitivity of n single dish radio telescopes all pointed in slightly different directions, observing simultaneously. Uh, now CHIME represents an extreme case of this concept where we have 1,024 antennas. And so we can form 1,024 beams in real time. And uh, this statement might seem too good to be true, and, but it is true that for most purposes, the raw observing power of this instrument is equivalent to like 1,024 copies of a single dish radio telescope, or big research telescope like GBT or Parks, all staring in uh, slightly different directions. Uh, it'll be useful, I want to show a few more cartoons for how Chime observes. It'll be useful to keep these pictures in mind throughout the talk. Uh, so the so-called primary beam or the sky sensitivity pattern that any single antenna in any single cylinder observes before beamforming is applied, 
uh, is this strip. The chime design is actually a compromise between optical focusing and software focusing. The uh, primary beam is pretty well focused in the east-west axis of the cylinder, but unfocused in the north-south direction, so we get a strip. And uh, then by uh, digital beamforming, as previ previously described, combining signals from all antennas in the system, we can form a 4 by 256 array of independent beams within the primary beam. So uh, the primary science uh, product from Chime is a map of the sky with the angular resolution of the formed beams, which is about a third of a degree. Uh, and uh, this whole pattern of primary beam and form beams just rotates with the Earth rotation. And every 24 hours, we see the whole sky, or the whole northern sky that can be observed from DRIO. Uh, so a few years ago, when I was thinking about this project, this is the uh, calculation I was doing in my head. Uh, from what I've said so far, you might surmise, and for most purposes, this is correct, that the uh, observing power of a radio telescope, or the mapping speed, is proportional to the area of the telescope times the number of beams uh, that you can afford to compute. Uh, the area of the telescope is setting the instantaneous sensitivity per beam, and then you just multiply it by the number of beams. And uh, with that definition of the mapping speed, which includes some order one factors that I've omitted for purposes of the back of the envelope comparison, things like noise temperatures, bandwidths, and so on, then uh, chime is uh, at the top of the list and in some weird units, which is not what anyone actually uses. Uh, then uh, Chime is at the top of the list, uh, comparable to fast and larger than these other telescopes. Uh, but uh, let's just think about what a ridiculous statement that is. Uh, here are Chime and fast compared to scale. Uh, Chime is this huge 500 meter telescope in China. It's one of the most ambitious projects in astronomy. And uh, Chime is, by comparison, a grassroots effort. Of course, we're su all super busy. We don't think of it that way. But uh, it's a few percent of the budget. And uh, so it just seems too good to be true that these two instruments can really be comparable in statistical power. But then this calculation seems too simple to be wrong. So I, a few years ago, I was <laughs> asking myself, what is, what is going on here? And uh, I was uh, not smart enough to figure out why this was so hard. And I might have chickened out if I had. But I, I'm gonna, I've organized the talks. So I'm going to come back to and explain why this is so hard. And uh, first, I'm going to show a few slides just explaining the science goals for what we hope to achieve with our high mapping speed. Um, so uh, uh, it's really exciting to give a chime talk that uses past tense. So we've now found mostly unpublished uh, ab around 700 new fast radio bursts. Uh, I'll talk more about fast radio bursts later, but uh, fast radio bursts are a um, poorly understood, relatively recent phenomenon in astronomy that have become uh, sort of a central unsolved problem to explain, like gamma ray bursts in the 70s or 80s. And uh, for comparison, the total number found by uh, all the other telescopes combined is 52. This slide is somewhat out of date. And now I know it's at least 55, and it may be more like 60. I'm not sure. You get the idea. Um, the, uh, I was really impressed by the uh, amount of um, press attention that our uh, early uh, science papers on fast radio bursts received, uh, most of which was responsible and didn't say we found aliens. Uh, uh, Chime is uh, also useful for timing known pulsars. Uh, I would not say that this is um, really one of our world-beating science goals, the way that in, um, uh, for, for fast radio bursts, we're like an order of magnitude ahead of everybody else. Uh, so Chime is useful for timing known pulsars. For example, to look for gravity waves. Um, at least uh, I'm more of a physicist, so that's uh, what I tend to think of first in this cartoon. Uh, if you're timing uh, all of the pulsars in the galaxy, then uh, when a gravity wave goes through this picture, and this would be a gravity wave on like light year wavelengths um, emitted by uh, supermassive black holes in um, merging galaxies like well before merger. Um, a very different uh, type of binary than the, than the kind observed by LIGO. Um, anyway, when a gravity wave goes through this picture, it will systematically advance um, pulse timings in some directions and delay timings in uh, others. And you can observe the gravity wave the same way that LIGO sees gravity waves by comparing light travel times between arms of an interferometer. Uh, anyway, Chime is, it, it turns out that uh, Chime is useful for this, but I would not say it's a world-beating instrument for pulsar timing since the frequency range we observe is a little bit too low. Uh, the um, ISM broadening effects on uh, pulsar timing uh, are, uh, go as a like, large negative power of the observing frequency. So the ideal 
frequency for observing pulsars is like a few gigahertz, and we're at 600 megahertz. Um, however, since uh, a project like Nanograv, which is already observing at those high frequencies, some order one fraction of their timing noise is due to uncertainty in propagation-related nuisance parameters. So by co-observing with Nanograv, we can reduce uh, timing uncertainties in Nanograv by an order one factor. Um, but if you were building an instrument from scratch to, so Chime's useful for this, but it's not like one of our headline uh, objectives. But if you were building an instrument from scratch, from scratch, you would build something like Chime, but observe at higher frequencies if you wanted to optimize for pulsar timing. Uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, in addition to, great question. Uh, in addition to timing known pulsars, Chime is also a really interesting instrument for finding new pulsars in a blind search. And this is something that I'm currently working on. Uh, so we have the raw sensitivity to find thousands of new pulsars. Uh, there, I, would, I should say that there's a massive algorithmic challenge here, finding an algorithm which is efficient enough to uh, search a data set as large as Chime and uh, uh, sift through and find all the pulsars. So the actual, I didn't put a hard number here because it uh, is more dependent on what you assume about algorithms than what you assume about the instrument. Um, and we're still working on those algorithms. And uh, finally, cosmology, uh, Chimes, which is what Chime was originally built to, to do. Uh, Chime's uh, forecasted BAO measurements from the 21 centimeter line are competitive with next generation large scale structure surveys like DESI or Euclid. Um, so um, Chime is a relatively uh, inexpensive instrument. $15 million is a small project on the scale of new telescopes nowadays. And uh, any one of these items would fully justify a larger project, I would say. And uh, so I was wondering if this is all, this all seems a little too good to be true. And uh, now I'm gonna explain why this is really hard. Uh, so I showed this table earlier where I just multiplied A and N to get the mapping speed, and I said that that rightmost column was the statist represented the statistical power of the telescope. And uh, that's true if you interpret it as statistical power under the assumption of uh, infinite computing power. Uh, but the computational cost of your, the analysis is proportional to this column, the number of beams, since that just sets the total data volume. Or maybe worse, it could be like the square of the number of beams, depending on what you're doing. Uh, so the chime strategy of increasing n, so that, that looks great if you're just looking at this table. It's much cheaper to increase n than it is to increase a. If you're just thinking about hardware cost, like you know, doubling the size of a dish is really expensive, but putting in twice as many antennas is really cheap. Uh, but it's really a strategy of moving difficulty from hardware to software. We're, well, we're really trying to do with Chime is say that we're going to uh, get a massive mapping speed uh, inexpensively and confront hard problems in software later. Uh, and uh, it's not actually a priori clear that this is a step in the right direction since radio astronomy uh, has a reputation for being one of the most computationally difficult uh, areas of astronomy. So computational challenges are really central and I want to talk in more detail about how Chime computes. So uh, in this, uh, I'm going to build up a block diagram in which each block is like some sort of custom-built uh, computing cluster that we have uh, running on site. Like one of these uh, boxes might be an array of uh, 100 computers that occupies a whole shipping container. Um, so the first thing that happens is that the electric field is fed on coax cables into this um, set of uh, custom-built FPGAs that uh, convert the analog signal to digital and also do a little bit of processing, breaking it up into frequency channels and some uh, non-trivial um, network rerouting that can be done very conveniently in FPGA. Uh, and uh, after this, the data is uh, channelized and digital. And uh, the raw data rate, just to quantify things a bit better, is 800 gigabytes per second, which is around 70 petabytes per day. Or uh, I like to, when I give talks, I like to convert to astronomers' units and say that this is 5,000 copies of the LSST telescope. <laughs> the uh, LSST is 15 terabytes per day. Uh, this is uh, one, what's that? Will be one day. <laughs> right, right. Uh, and uh, LSST is considered big data. So this uh, really shows like the uh, magnitude of the computational challenges that we're really up against. Um, the next thing that happens is that the, those digital signals go on uh, 1,010 gigabit ethernet cables into the GPU correlator, which is um, the largest part of the system in flops. Uh, and uh, what the, the correlator does, a certain computation that you're um, familiar with if you've uh, uh, 
worked on, thought about radio astronomy before, which is that it's computing the uh, two-point correlation function, or the so-called visibility matrix, of every pair of antennas in the system uh, in a, at a very high um, sampling rate, uh, at a, few, a sampling rate of a few microseconds. And uh, that uh, large matrix sampled at a few microseconds is way too much data to send out on the network or even write back to memory. There's not enough memory bandwidth. There's a similar issue with the SLA, though. Oh, yeah, yeah. Every radio telescope, basically. Um, uh, but uh, what you, but any, any data product that you're uh, interested in can be derived from that visibility matrix calculation that's happening in the correlator. Uh, so for example, if you're interested in searching for FRBs, uh, you would build a new uh, computing cluster, the, an FRB search backend, and then you would uh, request a certain data product from the correlator, which is small enough to fit onto the network. So uh, what we actually ask for in the FRB search backend is at, at all 1,024 beam locations, uh, we ask the correlator, uh, what is the sky temperature? Uh, at a time resolution of one millisecond and a frequency resolution of uh, 20 kilohertz. Um, other backends ask, ask for something different, like the pulsar timing backend is asking the correlator for uh, information at fewer sky locations, but more detailed information. We ask for the full electric field, both polarizations at the maximum possible time, re time and frequency resolution. Um, uh, so collectively, this is really just like a large heterogeneous data center. And uh, this has been a massive software project, and my role has mainly been to work on the FRB and Pulsar search backends, and uh, that's what I'll uh, mostly focus on in the talk. Uh, so I haven't said what an FRB is yet. Uh, so uh, FRB, here's a picture of an FRB. Uh, an FRB is a, uh, a, a new, very brief, transient event. Uh, it's a one millisecond uh, radio pulse, um, which is highly dispersed. Uh, so dispersed means that the arrival time of the pulse uh, is frequency dependent, and the delay is proportional to frequency to the minus two, which is what you expect for propagation of a pulse through a cold, unmagnetized plasma. Uh, FRBs are interesting because they have a very large dispersion delay, implying a large column depth of free electrons. That's what determines the total uh, dis dispersion delay in the plasma. Uh, and uh, FRBs are observed at uh, like high galactic latitudes where there's not many electrons in the galaxy to look through. Um, but they're uh, observed at very high dispersion, high implied electron column depth, uh, column density, uh, which uh, suggests that the FRB is, FRBs are at cosmological distances or far outside the galaxy. Um, I think at first there was a loophole in that argument because it could be that the FRB is in the galaxy, but whatever unknown physics produces the FRB also produces a lot of local electrons. Um, but now it's established that FRBs are at cosmological distances. Uh, we see a lot of them. They're isotropically distributed. And a few of them actually now have host galaxy associations, which are at cosmological redshifts. Uh, oh, no, this, I believe, was the, uh, if I remember correctly what I put in this uh, plot, this was the uh, uh, Lorimer burst, which was the first FRB discovered in 2007. It's not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay, yeah. See, I don't even know. I just take slides from, plots from wherever and put them in this slide. <laughs> uh, so, um, oh yeah, so I forgot to say that uh, um, prior to CHIME, uh, one FRB had been observed to repeat, which is, uh, um, of course, a very important clue to its origin. And uh, the repeating FRB was a real goldmine of information. Since you know where to look, you can point every telescope in the world at it. And so it was eventually observed in VLBI arrays, um, which have uh, much higher angular resolution, um, uh, angular resolution which is sufficient to identify host galaxy. Uh, the host galaxy was identified and uh, spectrum was taken and it was found to be at redshift uh, 0.2. Um, prior to time, a lot of telescope time had been spent following up uh, previously observed FRBs to look for more repeaters without success, which was sort of puzzling. So there was this one object that was called the repeater. The others didn't appear to repeat. Uh, so uh, here's my theory slide, which is really lame. I uh, can't do justice in a talk where I'm mostly going to talk about Chime to the variety of theories that have been proposed to explain these events, uh, except to say that uh, people have started writing papers like these, which are cataloging all of the theories that have been proposed. <laughs> so uh, a huge amount of uh, of uh, effort is uh, underway in the 
uh, theory community to uh, um, think about different explanations for these events. And we're trying to narrow things down. Um, so the uh, main search algorithm that runs on the FRB search node nodes, which um, finds the FRBs in real time and triggers. Uh, it was written by uh, me and this team of superheroes at Perimeter, including Dustin, who is a postdoc here in Princeton. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our code. This is a triggered search, so the um, purpose of the search, it doesn't have to be um, perfect in, find, in uh, discriminating uh, FRBs from uh, other systematic effects like human-made radio transmissions. But it has to uh, reduce the input data, which is around a petabyte and a half per day to uh, an amount which is, um, contains most or all of the FRBs and is manageable to store on disk and for humans to sift through. So it has to reduce the data volume. The trigger has to reduce the data volume by a factor of uh, at least 1,000 or so. Um, uh, I would say that our code is uh, orders of magnitude faster than other search software. Um, is near statistically optimal, although uh, when we wrote the code, we were optimizing for FRBs with a broadband frequency spectrum, since that appeared to be the case at the time. But since then, we've learned that FRBs have structured spectra, so I don't think that this statement is really true anymore, and this is something we need to re revisit. Um, it runs in real time with a low latency, which is necessary for a triggered search, where you have to do the whole search in a memory ring buffer. and. Uh, uh, you never get to write the data to disk unless you trigger. Um, we uh, search a huge, huge parameter space to a maximum DM, for example, which is much higher than the largest DM that has actually been observed. DM is dispersion measure. Thank you. Um, uh, what the num maybe the in the uh, usual units, the uh, resolution is like uh, 0 0.1 uh, parsecs per centimeters cubed. Um, I heard Robert Lupton is coming, so the next few slides are just for him. Uh, so uh, here's, uh, here's some uh, ordinary C++ code to take the uh, transpose of an n by n matrix. Uh, you might think that uh, uh, there's really no way to optimize this code further. Um, it's already written in a low-level language, except for testing which ordering of the for loops is fastest, but I, I, I already did that. Uh, so, but uh, it is possible to speed this code up by a factor of roughly four. Uh, so here's my version, which is four times faster. <laughs> and uh, here's, uh, here's what's going on. These are assembly language intrinsics that C++ uh, functions that really map one-to-one -one onto assembly language instructions. And uh, what's happening here is that in, uh, in 2019, surprisingly, uh, it is possible for the human compiler to beat the real compiler. Uh, if you're willing to get really clever about how you use the so-called SIMD registers, these are sp uh, special registers uh, that can hold more than one um, like floating point value at a time. Um, and uh, I would not recommend that uh, you normally <laughs> do this. I, uh, I think it, uh, it, the, the human time investment is really high. Um, so normally it's just better to let the computer run four times as long. Uh, unless you're writing like one um, code that's going to run for five years on a custom built supercomputer and you're already maxing out your hardware budget, like we couldn't have made it four times bigger. Um, so we actually had to get into this level of code optimization to make the search work. And so uh, we have like tens of thousands of lines of this stuff. Most of our um, like low-level kernels are uh, written in written in assembly language. Um, the expression template license sense, assume these to be instruction We do we do actually organize this as a bunch of like C with a bunch of C template metaprogramming so that you can reuse code better than this slide suggests. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll never do it again. Right. Uh, I, wanted to I want to give some sort of sense for the types of algorithms that we use to run the search. Um, and I think they're sort of pretty. Uh, so um, we use a so-called tree algorithm. And uh, I'll show a few cartoons to explain how it works. There are some technical details that I'm sweeping under the rug here. Uh, so the FRB search problem is as follows. Imagine that you uh, are an FRB search node. And you're receiving this array of sky temperatures, a 2D array indexed by a frequency channel and a time. And you're receiving it incrementally in time chunks. And uh, you want to search for FRBs that are buried in the noise. So to dig them out, you have to sum uh, these array elements over all uh, trial FRB trajectories, where a trial trajectory is indexed by an arrival time and a dispersion delay. 
And there are a huge number of trajectories to sum over in our search. There are 16,000 frequency channels and around 100,000 trial dispersion delays. So that's a lot of sums that you have to do. Uh, and uh, we do this efficiently using a recursive tree algorithm that I'll uh, describe in cartoons. So the first step is a regridding step where we um, replace the frequency axis by frequency to the minus two so that the problem becomes one of summing over all straight lines. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to describe an algorithm which approximates these straight line sums by a jagged sum of samples. Um, but we uh, understand the error that is um, introduced in that approximation and can arrange parameters to make it arbitrarily small. And uh, here's how these jagged sums are built up recursively. Uh, so this is a tree algorithm where the first step, I'm going to, I'm going to start doing an eight channel example. And uh, in the first step, I'm going to form all um, vertical sums shown in blue and all diagonal sums shown in red. A vertical sum just consists of two array elements that are related vertically and diagonal sum related diagonally. And I'll put all of the um, vertical sums in a left child array and all of the diagonal sums in a right child array. And uh, the color coding is supposed to show you how each um, element of a uh, child array corresponds to the sum of two or more elements in an ancestor. And uh, then I'm just going to repeat this exact same operation, forming vertical and diagonal sums uh, recursively on each of the children to get grandchildren. So after one more iteration, uh, this array element in the grandchild array corresponds to the sum of these two elements in the child array, and that corresponds to the sum of these four elements in the root. And you can see how the tracks are getting built up recursively. Um, and after one more uh, iteration, uh, each element of a great-grandchild array corresponds to a sum of eight elements in the root, and I've built up all possible uh, slopes. Um, and this algorithm is very efficient because it's um, reusing computations. Each element of a, uh, of, of a descendant array represents um, some sum of some computation involving two to the n elements of the root, which is reused in subsequent calculations. Um, so this is much more efficient than computing all of these sums from scratch. Um, it, it's more efficient by about the same factor that the um, FFT algorithm is more efficient than a brute force uh, Fourier transform. Um, so uh, I had never done radio astronomy before. And uh, I just totally misunderstood when I started this project where most of the work was. Uh, the, we, we spend most of our time trying to figure out, by far our largest problem with the FR research is getting rid of uh, RFI or um, radio frequency interference or human made radio transmissions. Um, so humans make a ton of, uh, like a cell phone a kilometer from the telescope is brighter than the sun in radio. Um, humans make a ton of radio transmissions and uh, also a great variety of different kinds of radio transmissions. And uh, it's very difficult to avoid being flooded with false positive FRBs. Um, so uh, our tool for mitigating RFI is um, building up a real-time um, Boolean mask in the time frequency plane before running the FRB search. Uh, qualitatively speaking, the way we distinguish uh, RFI from uh, FRBs is that uh, RFI tends to live in boxes in uh, axes. If the axes are radio frequency and time, then RFI tends to live in boxes. RFI tends to be in a certain frequency range for a certain amount of time. Um, FRBs, on the other hand, are um, distributed in across a range of frequencies. And then, so they show up as in boxes, or more properly as peaks, after applying the so-called de-dispersion transform. Uh, so we, um, uh, look for R we look for RFI by looking for outliers before the de-dispersion transform, and we find FRBs by looking for peaks or outliers uh, after the de-dispersion transform. Um, of course, there are many standard RFI removal software packages. Um, but uh, they don't suffice in Chime just because, uh, uh, partly because our data volume is just so large. They tend to be not optimized enough for us. Uh, another technical issue is that we have to do all of this um, uh, in real time, where you can um, only access the data in a window of order 10 seconds. Um, whereas uh, usually RFI is removed by collecting a lot of data and then uh, building summary statistics, which look at a lot of data at once. And uh, finally, and most seriously, uh, the false positive rate, um, which is standard in radio astronomy, is, is actually too high for Chime. 
Uh, in a smaller, a, a normal, like good false positive rate would, in a, for an FRB search would be a few false positives per beam per hour. And uh, if you have, uh, I don't know, a few hundred, order a few hundred beam hours of data, which is a normal number, uh, then uh, it's fine to sit to um, look at all those candidates by hand. Uh, but for Chime, if we had this false positive rate, we would have um, like 10 to the 5 events per day, uh, which is uh, way too many to, I guess we could store it to disk, but uh, what would we do with it after that? We, there would never be enough human time to actually inspect that many candidates. Um, so uh, we ended up with um, RFI removal code, which is uh, uh, actually really impressive. I think that uh, the success of our RFI removal code is uh, really the reason why the Chime FRB search is working as well as it is. Um, so in this plot, this plot is um, showing about nine hours of data. And uh, what this plot is showing is um, as a function of time and north-south beam position in the telescope, um, the um, uh, brightest event in sigmas that the FRB search backend thinks that it saw, there are no actual FRBs in this data. Um, the uh, flare-ups that you see here, most of them are actually um, pulsars, um, the known pulsars. Uh, a few of them are RFI false positives, but not, but not very many. Uh, the big problem in this plot are these big uh, vertical stripes, which are airplane transits. That actually turned out to be the hardest case for RFI removal when an airplane flies over the telescope. The, uh, the RFI doesn't come from, isn't, is not emitted by the airplane. Uh, the metal body of the airplane is acting like a mirror that's reflecting RFI from a much larger r radius. Uh, Chime is in a valley, and so like, I mean, there's an airport, um, you know, 10 miles away, but we don't see it. It's on the other side of the mountains. But when the airplane goes overhead, it uh, reflects a ton of RFI from a variety of sources into the telescope. Um, so, uh, but we, we actually get rid of those by querying real-time flight information, which is publicly available. Uh, anyway, we're doing, if we used, um, like, you know, standard software packages, this plot would be totally flooded with false positives, and we don't actually have that problem. Um, so, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how we did this, since it's really like the secret ingredient that makes all this work. And so, uh, in my opinion, uh, the RFI removal problem is more of a software engineering problem than uh, an, a numerical algorithms problem in the traditional sense. Uh, so our approach is to represent an uh, RFI removal strategy as a sequence of transform objects where each transform is sort of a micro operation that does something specific to the data. Uh, so you could um, clip outliers, you could enlarge the mask based on uh, clipping intensity with some amount of smoothing or clipping on variance with some amount of smoothing. Uh, or another micro operation would be to repeat the detrending or baseline subtraction or low pass filtering process, whatever you want to, high pass filtering process, whatever you want to call it, uh, after the mask has been enlarged. Uh, and so uh, we wrote a library of uh, transforms of building blocks, um, which are uh, all written in assembly language, um, but are available by a high level Python API so that anyone in the collaboration can experiment with the RFI strategy without being an assembly language programmer. And then, uh, and we have a nice like um, way of serializing this representation to disk, uh, so we can build up like a library of RFI removal strategies and a library of examples where um, strategies fail or succeed. And uh, over time, we've evolved our RFI strategy. And to to my surprise, we ended up needing about a hundred transforms. And there's some internal logic here that I could explain um, to uh, get RFI out at the level that we need. Um, so we're, we're using a much deeper and more iterative approach than is usually used. We have a lot more filters and we're um, doing things like iterating the detrending process after the mask has been enlarged to get out lower level RFI. And uh, this approach is, has it proven to be extremely powerful in Chime. And uh, I expect it will be really powerful for other telescopes too. And uh, when we uh, eventually um, clean up this code and make it public, uh, then uh, I uh, hope that it will have a large impact in, in uh, radio astronomy and be really useful for a lot of people. Um, okay, so uh, uh, after talking about the idea and all the challenges, I want to uh, talk about the um, early results from Chime. Um, so we started finding FRBs um, about 15 months ago. Our first FRB was detected uh, in August 2018. 
And uh, we put out something called an astronomer's telegram, which uh, I had actually never heard of before, but there's a website where you can post your plots and call them a telegram. Uh, <laughs> then uh, in our first month of, we didn't actually expect to be finding FRBs this early. This is when we were in like a commissioning state where we were just starting to install a few nodes. And so during like the first few months of data, we had a very evolving system where we were like installing new computers and increasing the number of beams and uh, debugging, so our sensitivity was, was going up. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in the first uh, month of data, we found 13 new FRBs, uh, including a new repeater, which was really exciting. And so uh, based on that first month of commissioning data, we put out these uh, first two papers, paper one and paper two. Uh, since then, uh, a lot of events have been coming in. I mentioned earlier that we have something like 700 FRBs unpublished. Uh, it has been a challenge to uh, digest all of this data and write science papers. Um, having 700 FRBs is uh, a really amazing opportunity uh, to do statistics. Uh, but uh, it also means that you have to understand the selection, of the selection function of the instrument very well. It's not enough to just say, oh, we found this object, here's a plot. You have to know what is the probability that if an FRB went off at this sky location with, these, with this set of parameters, what's the probability that we'd actually trigger? And uh, we're still uh, uh, like, and that involves a lot of instrument modeling, beam modeling, calibration, and so on. And so we're still building up the understanding that we need to write um, papers which do population studies. Uh, so we have this, this set of four papers does not do justice to the uh, amount of data that we've collected or the number of papers that we have in progress that are all kind of um, waiting on the same bottlenecks. Um, paper three was uh, a, a detection of the original repeater, uh, which it's not surprising that we saw it. It's a um, slightly, we, it, it had never been observed at uh, chimes low frequencies before, but it's been observed at a wide range of frequencies from um, around one gigahertz to around eight gigahertz. So it's not very surprising we saw it at 600 megahertz. Um, in uh, September, we wrote a paper. Our sample of 700 FRBs includes some repeaters. And uh, it's interesting to, for new repeaters, it's interesting to just announce that you found them without um, worrying so much about population statistics. Uh, so I can tell you that in our commissioning data through March, we found eight new repeaters, plus this repeater for a total of nine. And so uh, we wrote a paper just um, showing all of the pulses that we found and announcing the detection of these new repeaters. So repeating FRBs are not, uh, not rare. Um, so I'll just go through each of these papers and uh, describe them in more detail. Um, so uh, here are the first uh, 13 FRBs that we found in our commissioning data. So um, one thing that's interesting is that these were at lower frequencies than previous FRB observations. Uh, so prior to CHIME, almost all of the FRBs were found at around 1.4 um, gigahertz. That's a very popular um, frequency for doing radio astronomy for non-FRB related reasons. It's just the rest wavelength of the 21 centimeter line. Um, so prior to CHIME, almost all the FRBs had been found at 1.4 uh, gigahertz, um, with a few found at um, around 800 megahertz in GBT and um, utmost. Um, but uh, all searches at um, frequencies of 200 megahertz or less had been unsuccessful in uh, MW MWA and LOFAR, I think, are, I think are the instruments that had checked. And uh, so prior to CHIME, there was uh, evidence for a spectral cutoff. It, it appeared that FRBs were easy to find at frequencies of around gigahertz and just not present at 200 megahertz. Uh, however, uh, with CHIME, at least in our 13, uh, uh, element sample, um, we don't really see any evidence for a, an approaching cutoff. Um, there's, no, uh, there's no preference for flux at the upper end of the band at 800 megahertz as opposed to 400 megahertz. I mean, about, about half of the sample is brighter at 800 megahertz than it is at 400, and about half of the sample, it's vice versa. Um, so it's kind of hard to see how a spectral cutoff can be consistent with CHIME. Uh, of course, it's still possible to put a sharp cutoff between 200 megahertz and 400 megahertz, but uh, it's hard to see how you would arrange that in a model. Like the usual mechanisms you might think of, like free-free absorption, uh, would not accommodate a very sharp cutoff, especially after you convolve it by the FRB redshift distribution. Now that we, yeah, yeah, um, and so. Uh, 
There was another one. One interesting. Um, there was a paper on the spectral cutoff that was interesting, where uh, NFRB was. Th there was a co-observation um, between ASCAP and the MWA, where ASCAP found a really bright FRB at 1.4 gigahertz, and uh, MWA was co-observing at 185 megahertz, and uh, didn't see anything. And uh, there was a paper arguing that the spectrum, you know, has to be. This was hard to explain through like uh, propagation effects, like scattering, pulse scattering, and uh, there had to be some sort of spectral cutoff. And uh, indeed, that's totally plausible on a per object basis. You can see that these FRBs uh, often have spectra that don't fill, are not broadband, don't fill the whole band. And so uh, uh, for a single object, it's totally plausible that this, the FRB could be bright at 1.4 gigahertz and faint at uh, 200 megahertz. Uh, but it's hard to see given this population how there can be like a population-wide cutoff. Um, so I'm not sure what's going on here, but I uh, suspect that the low-frequency searches have just been unlucky and will eventually be successful. Um, so uh, scattering refers to the frequency-dependent um, broadening of a pulse um, due to multipath propagation through an inhomogeneous plasma. Um, the uh, amount of pulse broadening is uh, roughly proportional to frequency to the minus four. Uh, so chime being at low frequency makes the best measurements of FRB scattering. Uh, so about uh, around half of our 13 FRBs are significantly scattered at chime frequencies. Um, the level of scattering seen in chime is, uh, uh, so to calculate, to calculate scattering, you have to integrate the amount of small scale structure in the uh, plasma between uh, the FRB and the observer. Uh, and uh, the level of scattering that we see is higher than you would expect given the, uh, uh, given the amount of uh, small scale structure, electron structure in the Milky Way. Uh, if you assume that the source galaxies of the FRBs are like the Milky Way, if you take a uh, uh, Milky Way at a random distance, at a random orientation, and randomly put the FRB somewhere in the disk, uh, then you would uh, see, we find that you would see less scattering than we actually observe in Chime. Uh, so this is some sort of evidence that uh, scattering is, or small scale structure in the electron distributions are local to the FRB. Although I think there's a significant loophole here is that we're assuming Milky Way-like galaxies. So it probably uh, depends on the galaxy, to what you assume about the source galaxies of the FRB. Um, we found a new repeating FRB. Um, here are uh, five pulses that we observed in our first um, month of commissioning data. Uh, something that's um, interesting to see in these pulsars, in these pulses. Um, so it had been um, noticed that in the original repeater, um, that uh, high signal, if you make a high signal to noise observation, I forgot to say, but it's probably obvious that when I show um, plots of the pulse indexed by frequency and time, uh, that I've de-dispersed the pulse. I've removed the um, you know, l big zeroth order delay that comes from the dis uh, propagation through the plasma. Um, so after removing that dispersion, there's still so some, some structure still remains. The pulse is really, uh, looks like a few subpulses that march downward in central frequency. And uh, there are uh, explanations for this that involve like some sort of gradient in a plasma. Uh, for example, a popular FRB model is to uh, say that an FRB is a flaring magnetar surrounded by a supernova remnant. And uh, as the um, pulse propagates through the um, electrons in the supernova remnant, uh, there, are, there are multiple shocks. And uh, the relativistic electrons are slowing down. They have different Lorentz factors, which is shifting the central frequency down, downward. Uh, this type of downward Marching structure is, you know, also seen in other plasma physics contexts, like uh, um, like uh, flare stars. Um, anyway, we see the same structure in our um, repeater, which was really interesting to see. That uh, appears to not be a one-off feature. Um, in our third paper, we, um, you know, detected the original repeater at lower frequencies than it had previously been detected. Um, so. Uh, this, uh, I think there's nothing super surprising about this paper, except uh, one little puzzle is that the dispersion measure that we find when we um, you know, fit for the time-dependent delay of the pulse is about 1% higher than previously reported values. 
And uh, I don't actually have a theory for what is happening there, so I'm going to avoid speculating. Uh, it may be that the, maybe it's evidence that the dispersion delay is not exactly frequency to the minus two, so that um, we, you get a, a, when you do the fits, you get a larger apparent dispersion if you're fitting at low frequency versus high frequency. Um, or it could be that the uh, dispersion measure is changing with time and our observation is just the most recent. Uh, we just thought it once. Um, uh, this paper, which, uh, which was really fun, was our paper um, reporting the detection of eight new repeaters. Uh, I should say that there is a bit of a judgment call in deciding whether a repeating object, or even a single pulse, um, is an FRB or not. An FRB, by definition, is an extragalactic pulse. So uh, what you have to do is compare the observed dispersion measure of the pulse to the maximum dispersion that you can explain by integrating out to the edge of the galaxy, given the sky observed sky location of the FRB. And uh, that requires a model. So there are models that radio astronomers have built up for the, um, uh, dis for the um, electron structure of our galaxy that are you know, kind of messy. They're modeled as like a disk plus a uh, little uh, a center. And they include like some little ad hoc star forming regions or H2 regions. And so uh, it is possible that, for example, if you compare um, the model that everyone was using in 2001 to the model that everyone was using in 2016, uh, there are a few isolated sky locations where the predicted um, dispersion measure has gone way up because there was some feature in the electron distribution that we didn't know about in 2001. Um, so it's always a concern that, um, you know, for example, for source number two in this table, we observe it, the observed dispersion measure is around 100, and uh, the predicted maximum is around 40. But if that is an anomalous line of sight where the model is under predicting, then uh, maybe we think it's an FRB, but it's really just uh, um, giant pulses from a pulsar in our galaxy, or neutron star in our galaxy. Um, so I would say that in this table, I am, um, about 95% confident that the first two objects are FRBs. Um, you know, they exceed the uh, predicted maximum dispersion of our galaxy by a moderate amount. And the remaining six, it's um, unambiguous that they're extragalactic FRBs. Um, so here's every pulse that we uh, observe from our eight new repeaters. Uh, the first um, uh, 25 pulses total, uh, unfortunately, they're not, the plot is not actually labeled for which pulses came from which object. Um, the top uh, two rows, the 10 pulses in the top two rows, are all from one object. There was one uh, repeater that re uh, repeated 10 times before March. And uh, in the, for the remaining repeaters, we either observe them two times or three times. Um, so. Uh, Many of these pulses do show the downward marching structure that I talked about previously, um, around half or maybe a little bit less than half. Um, the frequency spectra are, are usually structured and are, are sort of jumping around all over the place. Um, I, uh, I pointed out that the top, the top 10 pulses are all from the same object because you can see that even for a single object, the frequency spectrum is changing quite a bit from pulse to pulse. Um, in fact, the uh, the third and fourth um, plot here are actually, were actually taken about 10 minutes apart. This uh, repeater repeated uh, twice in the same um, crossing of the primary beam. So from, uh, in the span of 10 minutes, you can see the frequency spectrum. If I compare this one to this one, uh, the frequency spectrum changed a little bit. Um, all of that behavior was observed in the original repeater, so it's not um, especially surprising. Um, for one of our pulses, we were successful in capturing the, uh, the, the baseband or electric field data for um, the event. That's something that should, so sometimes we always succeed in capturing the intensity data, which is just the sky temperature as a function of frequency and time at, with, at some level of downsampling. And sometimes we succeed in capturing the electric field data, which is a much larger um, data volume that uh, just gives the um, complete electric field state at every antenna during the event. Um, that will eventually happen for every pulse, but um, at the time of these observations, it was happening occasionally for technical reasons. Um, so if we succeed in capturing the baseband data, then there's a lot more interesting analysis that you can do. 
um, you can uh, you, you get the polarization. Um, so for this um, event, the um, we found that the uh, pulse was nearly 100% linearly polarized. And uh, the Faraday rotation measure is modest. I should explain what Faraday rotation measure is. Uh, if the pulse is significantly linearly polarized uh, and there is a magnetic field along the line of sight, it's um, actually the line of sight integral of the electron density times the uh, radial component of the electric field that matters, uh, then the orientation of the electric, of the, um, of the pol linear polarization will rotate with frequency. Um, so that's called Faraday rotation, and it tells you something about the strength of the magnetic field. And uh, we observe a uh, very modest uh, Faraday rotation measure for this pulse, which is actually like almost exactly what you get if you just integrate a model of the Milky Way um, magnetic field to the edge of the galaxy. Um, so this suggests that there's little or no magnetization um, you know, outside of our galaxy contributing. Um, now the original repeater, one of the most interesting results for the, about the original repeater is that uh, first off it was, um, it was nearly 100% linearly polarized, which we also see in our repeater. Uh, but uh, the original repeater had a huge uh, rotation measure. In uh, weird radio astronomers units, it's 10 to the 5, which is, uh, makes it the second most magnetized object in the sky after our galactic center, um, uh, which implied a highly magnetized environment and is a very interesting clue. Um, but apparently the linear polarization is um, uh, generic, but the um, high rotation measure of the original repeater is not. Um, this baseband data is really important for um, other reasons. It lets you, for example, um, fit for the um, duration of the pulse to better than a millisecond. Um, normally our um, statistical error on the pulse duration is um, of order a millisecond because that's our intensity time sampling. But uh, if you have the baseband data, you can do so-called coherent dispersion and make the statistical error of order like a few nanoseconds. Um, giant pulses from, um, from uh, other objects in our galaxy, like the Crab Nebula, are sometimes observed to be as short as a nanosecond. So it'll be interesting to see whether that's true for FRBs as well. Um, and uh, finally, I should say that if you have the baseband data and you have uh, outrigger telescopes that are co-observing and collecting baseband data, then you can do VLBI localization and get host galaxies, which is something I'll come back to later. Um, oh yeah, so you have to compute chance. So we just say it's a repeater if we see two pulses at the same sky location and dispersion measure within statistical error. And uh, then we have to compute the chance coincidence probability. Um, so for us, that's always, t with our current sample, is uh, of order 10 to the minus 6 or below. Uh, there are about 10 to the, at our angular resolution, there are about 10 to the 5 trial sky locations and about 10 to the 4 trial DMs. So there's a 10 to the 9 uh, element space. And uh, by the birthday paradox, you need uh, 10 to the 4.5 events, or a few hundred, a few tens of thousands, um, before you have to worry about chance coincidences. Um, uh, yeah, we'll get there, and then you have to observe three pulses, or you can say for sure. Um, oh yeah, and this so f um, in this sample um, that we we found eight objects. One of which re repeated 10 times, one of which re repeated uh, three times, and the other six of which repeated twice. Um, so there appears to be some sort of long tail distribution. So the repeats, or is that the total number of um, detections? Did you, did you see those? You said they repeated twice. Oh, that's the total number of detections, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so I would. One yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, I make off by one errors in my code all the time, too. Uh, Okay, uh, so it's interesting to ask whether, um, an open question is whether repeating and non-repeating FRBs are the same type of object or not, as was the case historically for long duration and short duration gamma ray bursts. Um, and so it's interesting to do population uh, statistics to compare like fitted parameters for repeating and non-repeating FRBs. Um, so based on the uh, events that we've published, which uh, are 12 non-repeating FRBs and nine repeating FRBs, uh, the statement that we were willing to make with uh, confidence is that repeaters have wider pulses as a population than non-repeating FRBs. Uh, these histograms show the uh, you know, uh, pulse width distributions for the repeating and non-repeating FRBs. 
Um, the difference between the two plots, by the way, is um, it depends on if you see multiple pulses from the same repeater, whether you plot them individually in the histogram or whether you just plot the median. Um, so the, the distributions are obviously different, and the formal significance is something like four sigma. Um, now, there's been a lot of, a lot of people have like, stared at plots like this and speculated on other differences. For example, I would um, claim that heuristically, uh, repeaters tend to show the downward marching structure more often than the non-repeaters, and the um, uh, you might notice at, uh, or that the frequency spectra of repeaters tend to be more structured. But uh, I don't think we can make those statements with statistical confidence with our samples. But we will be able to uh, very soon. Um, okay, so uh, that's that brings me to the end of uh, the discussion of our early science results. Uh, except for I just like to. Uh, generate hype by saying that we have some just super interesting results that are coming out very soon that unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I uh, could not uh, uh, get permission to talk about in the talk, but in uh, maybe as soon as a few weeks. Um, so click the uh, daily archive email with anticipation. <laughs> oh, sorry? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, okay, so uh, I want to just conclude with some uh, thoughts on all of this. Um, so uh, I, I think that like, something really interesting is happening in radio astronomy where thanks to, um, you know, new software techniques and also some new uh, hardware developments like GPUs with tensor cores are really important for us. Um, uh, you can, for, for around $15 million, which is a small project nowadays, you can build the world's most powerful radio telescope. For many purposes, Chime is the world's most powerful radio telescope. Um, well, you would hope that you would just um, pay those once, right? Uh, but uh, you'll have this huge, uh, this immense data rate, and you'll need to solve extremely hard computing problems. So this whole program for scaling up astronomy really just hinges on the question of whether these, how well we can do on these software problems. And uh, for FRBs, um, we're, um, uh, we're doing great. I think we've convincingly shown that we have solved the FRB search problem in a chime-sized uh, data set. And there are other problems that we're still trying to solve, like the pulsar search problem or uh, the uh, problem of separating foregrounds from signal for 21 centimeter cosmology. Uh, now, it's our hope that we uh, are doing the um, computational groundwork now to um, like rethink these algorithmic foundations and establish new software. Um, and uh, that we can solve these problems once, and uh, then scaling in the future will not take um, years to write software packages from scratch. Um, so, uh, so Chime is Chime. We really see is I mean, it's an interesting telescope, but it's also like a test bed or a first step um, toward uh, scaling up uh, radio astronomy by orders of magnitude. And uh, I would say that uh, um, if things work as well as we hope, there's a clear path on the hardware side to. Uh, scale things up by like a factor of 100 or so in, in mapping speed in the near future. Um, so for example, um, a, uh, a South African project that Perimeter Institute is involved in is Hyrax, uh, which is, I should say that this is a, um, uh, an artist rendition of what Hyrax will look like when it's finished. It's not actually built yet. It's uh, a few, just a few dishes at a, a test site. Uh, then uh, is using uh, the big difference, there are two major differences between Hyrax and Chime. Um, so uh, the first is that Hyrax is using an array of dishes instead of an array of antennas in a cylindrical telescope. Uh, the second really interesting difference is that Hyrax will have um, outrigger telescopes from the beginning. So there will be a core interferometer, which is similar to Chime, a, a compact interferometer. Uh, and then uh, scattered all over the southern part of the African continent, there will be outrigger stations with maybe 16 dishes that always look in the same direction as the core. Um, and so when you find an FRB in the core, uh, you, since we find it in real time, uh, we can send an alert out to the outriggers. And the outrigger telescopes are just dumb devices that um, save their baseband data in a memory buffer. They're, they aren't doing any analysis of it. There wouldn't be a correlator, for example. And uh, when they their um, purpose in life is to receive a trigger from the core and write their baseband data to disk. And uh, then you can uh, gather that uh, data later offline um, and you have uh, uh, all, of the v all of the data that you need to do a VLBI analysis of the FRB and get a sky localization. Um, so uh, 
Hyrax has, uh, it turns out, about four times the collecting area of chime and the same number of beams. Uh, so it would have about four times the chime mapping speed. Uh, and uh, you know, if Hyrax works well and we, we want to continue on this path, then doubling the size of Hyrax increases uh, the mapping speed by an additional factor of four because the uh, total area and the number of beams both increase by two. Uh, in Canada, we're currently proposing a um, follow-up project to Chime called Cord, uh, which um, uh, we use dishes uh, like Hyrax and also includes some um, other in improvements in instrumentation. We're um, uh, using wideband feeds that search um, a wider frequency range, um, which is super interesting for pulsar timing. Uh, unlike Chime, which cuts off at 800 megahertz, Chord will search up to 1500 megahertz, uh, which uh, means that Chord will be a fantastic instrument for um, timing known pulsars and looking for gravity waves. And uh, lower noise amplifiers are hoping for a system temperature of 30K instead of 50 Kelvin. Uh, collectively, these improvements uh, improve the effective mapping speed of Chime by like a factor of eight. And uh, like Hyrax, we'll have outriggers. These uh, blue stars are, um, you should, please don't take them too seriously. These are just candidate locations for interferometers. We're still determining uh, the exact locations. And uh, there's a plan for building uh, cord up incrementally so that uh, we'll build the outriggers first, um, which have already uh, been uh, funded, most, mostly funded, thanks to the Moore Foundation, um, so that the uh, outriggers can co-observe with the chime core and then we'll later build the chord core. Uh, so if you take like FRB discovery rate and angular resolution as a figure of merit for a radio telescope, then uh, we're already finding like a few FRBs per day in Chime at modest angular resolution. And uh, in a couple of years, we should have uh, outriggers and uh, we'll find uh, FRBs at the same rate, uh, but with um, uh, angular resolution of say um, 10 milli arc seconds, which is good enough for a host galaxy, um, which, would, well, which would be a, a, a total game changer for the field. Uh, and then uh, a few years after that, we might uh, increase our FRB event rate by a factor of 10 or so when the cord core comes online. Um, so uh, this is all happening really fast. Like uh, even a few years ago, even just discovering one FRB was uh, um, you know, sufficient to write a whole paper. And uh, in maybe five years, we'll have catalogs of tens of thousands of FRBs with precise localizations. We'll know which galaxy they're in, where they go off. We'll be doing like FRB catalog astronomy. Um, uh, so another situation, so I think uh, something really interesting has been like under development in radio astronomy for a few years now, which is why I got uh, interested in this. Um, but uh, not a lot of people um, know about it because uh, we, are just starting to have our um, first initial successes. Um, like the FRBs have been really successful and there's lots of other things that we uh, are working on. And uh, in other contexts in astronomy where we've um, been able to scale up instrumentation by orders of magnitude, we've made um, really fundamental new discoveries, maybe found new surprises. And so uh, the discovery space here is uh, really huge and this will be um, really interesting in the next few years. Uh, thanks, oh, I went over time, sorry about that.